LA's most terrifying band. They don't need anything. Unadorned power. Circle jerks. Hey, Keith. Oh, hold it, hold it. Okay. Come. Oh. Oh, goodbye. Dude, my finger. Get up, my back. Jump. Get me alone. Stupid punk rock. I don't, you know, I just think of it as rock and roll because that's what it is. Neighbors. Your answer is non sequitur. This is Stan with the Punk Rock Chronicles podcast. And we actually are really, really stoked today um, with our special guest. But before we get started, I want to introduce our uh, trusty cohorts. Uh, we've got Bob the Bastard. Hey. And we got Chris, uh, our producer. He's behind the scenes, but he's uh, taking care of all the audio, getting things going. Hello. And uh, <clears throat> today we're really fucking stoked because we've got Ed Culver, who's a... Uh, let us come into his home again, and we've got Keith Morris on the line, or in person with us today. So, Look, welcome, I guys. I could drive home and call, call you it back. In. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I call it in. <laughs> <laughs> Reduce it. But, uh, yeah, we're stoked to uh, have these guys with us today. Um, thank you, Ed, for inviting us down. And um, Thanks for coming. Yeah, absolutely. So, I guess we just want to get started, and, and, you know, when's the last time you guys have seen each other? It's been a while this time. Like it's that. it's been over a year. Yeah. It's been bit even longer than that. Probably. COVID did. What one of our friends passed away recently. Well, not recently, but the one of the last times I was here, he was out here on the front porch smoking cigars. Oh wow. And um, mm -hmm. we're 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 talking about uh, Steve yeah, Human. Yeah. yeah. Who played bass with the Vandals, and he also played bass in Detox, R.I.P. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So yeah, yeah, I heard about that. That's sad. When did you guys actually get to meet? When you guys meet each other for the first time? Well, we we bumped <laughs> elbows at the Hong Kong Cafe back in what seventy eight, seventy nine. Seventy nine. Yeah. Yeah, I got a bad picture of you wrestling uh, kick boy on the floor of the Hong Kong. I would like to see that. <laughs> you still well, have that? Yeah. Not we yet. we actually, uh, uh, kick boy and I became drinking buddies. <laughs> yeah. Kick boy was one of the uh, staff writers at Slash Magazine. Oh, okay. He was also in a band called Catholic Discipline. So uh, you guys have known each other since the late 70s. Uh, We've you... known each other too long. <laughs> <laughs> too long. Were you shooting back then? Yeah. Yeah, I started yeah. shooting in the late 78. Late 78, okay. And after a year or two, I started turning up a, a few good things. Um, your story is one of my favorite stories of any of the photographers. Because yeah. I know a lot of photographers, you know a lot of photographers, but that camera was sitting on that table and you saw it and you swooped on it and started using it. That's a great story. Yeah. Can you talk about that? Is that when you just started shooting, or no? <laughs> uh, he doesn't want anybody knocking on his door. Yeah, it's like forty-five years later. We're <laughs> no, clear on that one. <laughs> I, I boosted a camera out of this warehouse that I was working in, in which somebody left it from the front office, left it out in there, in the warehouse, and I threw it in my lunchbox and brought it home. Nice. And, and the rest is history. Yeah. yeah. Who was the first band you ever shot? And how, how did that come about? Gun or camera? Uh, camera. Oh. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, you'll have other people knocking on your door. <laughs> yeah, really. Um, the motels, actually. Really? Yeah. Would that, would, that would have been Madame Wong's, right? Yep. Yeah. I only went there a couple of times. I saw Robert Stoddard band there. And uh, the motel. I like the early motels. That was a cool record. That first record. You know, I kind of detest ninety 
9.9% of new wave music, but I like that record a lot. Well, they had something going on that wasn't exactly yeah. new wave. Yeah. They, would, they were a little bit more of a, they had a little bit more of a rock thing going on. Something. Although they didn't really just rock out, I mean, mm -hmm. not in a motorhead kind of way, yeah. but they had their thing going on. Yeah. Kind of like Concrete Blonde. Yeah, a little bit. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I worked with them too. So what was uh, Madam Wong's back then? We, we Obviously we weren't old enough to... I always said it was where New Wave went to die. I only went there a couple times very first when I started venturing out after not going to very many shows. I went to shows in the 60s a lot when I was a teenager and stuff. You know, I saw the Mothers and, I don't know, Blue Cheer, Captain B Park, like all kinds of shows. Um, but I didn't go out much in the 70s until 78 and uh, started taking pictures. Uh, uh, you know, the Hong Kong Cafe opened up. It was like right across an alley from Madam What's Her Names. Remember the ad that said uh, they were always. Jen a, Ling Wei. Yeah, they were on a uh, war with each other. <laughs> I read somewhere that, yeah, Madam Wong's was more geared towards like. Um, Safe music. Y right. And if you um, played in a punk band, you weren't really welcome there? Um, they, she did not have. Very, she had a handful of punk rock bands played there. I know the Bags played there because I saw the Bags there. Mm -hmm. I saw um, one night uh, I was getting ready to go up the stairs. I just opened the the front door to go up the stairs, and Nikki Beats, hmm. Nikki Beat had been thrown out physically, and he was rolling down the stairs, <laughs> and he landed at my feet. I did go to Madame Wong's because I saw Los Lobos there. Mm -hmm. I saw the Plim Souls there. I think I might have even seen X play there. I think they did. So uh, early on, yes, yeah, so, and then the Hong Kong Cafe was across the street. You said there was a kind of a... Well, it's not a street. Alley, right? It was... There's a square. Oh, okay. Yeah. And it was right there. On the, on the, on the east end of... The, the block gotcha. on the east end, the east entrance coming in, yeah. it opens up and it's this big wide space and there's Madame Wong's and there's the Hong Kong Cafe and there's eight million Chinese restaurants. <laughs> what were uh, some of your more memorable shows going to Hong Kong Cafe? Oh, mm. Pretty much all the shows I saw, they were great. That was really fun. You know, I saw the Circle Dirks and Fear and the Bags and X and the Weirdos. And I didn't see Black Flag there, though. I don't recall. You uh, you didn't happen to be there on that Monday night when um, we had a uh, one of our heroes was in the audience. And the audience was very thin. Mm -hmm. And this would, this would have been the show that everybody, all of the, the punks that lived in Hollywood would have been at. Mm -hmm. And um, we we played, the, the room probably, there might have been two dozen people in the room. Mm -hmm. And the, the way that they had the tables set up facing the stage, we looked down one of the rows of tables, and at the very end was David Bowie with two humongous, uh, these guys probably played, they were probably um, defensive linemen for the USC Trojans. Oh. <laughs> like, don't mess with me. You can say yeah. hi, but don't don't touch me. Mm -hmm. And everybody was there. If huh. if you if you talk to all of the people, <laughs> of the the Los Angeles, Hollywood, yeah. Southern California punk rock scene, there were there were probably eight hundred people there. <laughs> Yeah, it's funny. Everybody seems to remember being at those those uh, those shows, those important monumental shows. Everyone seems to say they were there, but you said there was like two dozen people, huh? I it, the it, it, it was. I was there. It was. But I missed that one. <laughs> that that was that was that was a night where our percentage of the door was like zero. <laughs> <laughs> That's kind of typical, isn't it? <laughs> did he stick around for the whole set? Uh, he did. Did he uh, we, did he give you any feedback? We did not ask his <laughs> if, if it was a yay or a nay. Mm -hmm. Try to play it cool. Well, it wasn't Monday night. It was like, what else are you going to do if you're 
like say you're recording an album in LA or you're uh, you're on some kind of press junket and you're in LA and you're going to be talking to every big wig rock magazine or you know people magazine or us magazine or time or mm. any of that stuff yeah. Well, also, the scene was burgeoning then, and things were still relatively new. I mean, yeah, you had punk that predated what, where you guys were at the time, but not, only by a couple of years. So this whole thing was fresh. L.A. starting to explode with new bands, a new scene, and all this stuff. So it was all relatively, I would imagine, pretty fascinating for these guys to come in to check out what was happening, right? Like, you guys, Black Flag was getting a name at that point already. Uh, we were trying to get a name. Did you have did you have any other any other notable people that showed up that you saw in the audience or like holy shit there's so and so? Not that I can remember. Well you're pretty good with the Duke. You know, uh the thin white dude. Thin white dude. Uh, Ron Jeremy's in the crowd at the Darby Crash Band show at the Starwood. Is that weird? That's exciting. Yeah. That's, well, that's great not, to know. That's pretty funny. Though. Well, I saw I, I actually saw him at a show on Hollywood Boulevard, and Hole was playing. Oh yeah. Yeah. Oh, wow. So the group sex. Can you talk about the group sex album cover? That iconic photo. How that all came about. Um, sure. <laughs> we. Um, when I say we, that would be the Circle Jerks. Yes. Played, uh, and I want to say the the band that played with us was the Adolescents. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I, I, I actually think Dead Hippie played the Stingers in Venus in Unit Three. I, I I've heard Dead Hippie played that day, which I weird. I I don't recall that. I don't remember any other bands playing. Yeah. Just just the two of us. Yeah. I mean, be, Those are between the photos, between though. the. The, between the circle jerks and the adolescents, we could have had two or three hundred people at the skate park. Yeah. The, the skate park was down in Marina del Rey, and what they were doing was they um, opened up to allowing bands to play there. In the punch bowl. It, mm. it there wasn't. There was nothing close to it either. It was it, in the between the on and off ramp of the freeway. But it also wasn't; these shows weren't on a regular basis because they weren't a, they weren't a proper venue. Yeah. That the, this this was the kind of thing where they it was like guerrilla style. Mm -hmm. If the cops showed up, sure, they sure. they could have been closed. They could have been closed down, mm -hmm. and they were if they were located very conveniently in in a in. Uh, a spot that was, uh, it was easy, very accessible from all of the different areas. Mm -hmm. Lincoln Boulevard, um, the 405 Freeway. Yeah, so South Bay and all that. The, yeah. Just over the hill from the South Bay. But you I had Venice, you <laughs> had Santa Monica. Yeah, yeah. I've never seen that picture. Like, I think Casey Royer's picking his nose. Yeah. <laughs> did you like? Did you know ahead of time that you were going to set that shot up, or was it on the fly? Um, well, I was supposed to do a photo, and there's kind of been different stories that it was all spontaneous, and they just got all the people in the bowl and had me take a picture. But I had color film with me, so that kind of proves I was there to shoot the album cover. Right. And the picture came out. Uh, you know, it was color initially, and then it got rendered into a black and white stat print mm -hmm. and colorized by Diane's in Cabbage. I think it looks great. Yeah. But it was funny, it was originally color, then high contrast black and white, and it colorized. So it came out good. Oh, yeah, it's iconic, obviously. Um, man, yeah, there's so much to unpack with this. So um, you guys met 79, 80, and you'd, you've been active since you said 77 or 78? Or was it later Me? than that? Yeah, as, as a I photographer? I started going to shows in the scene in late 78. Like okay. Real late 78. But I was around all the time. You know, I saw you guys a lot of times. You'd always see me if you'd go out, probably. So everybody, everybody's pretty well versed in Black Flag's history if you're any kind of a, you know, a punk fan. Um, how long was the, the initial run of Black Flag with you in it? Like, 
From start to finish, you think? Um, I was in Black Flag for three years. Yeah. And we spent probably two of those years just trying to figure out what was going on. Like, we didn't really know what we were doing. Uh -huh. The blind leading the blind. And um, it didn't really, we didn't really become a real band until um, Chuck the Duke stepped up when we asked him to play bass with us. Uh -huh. See, we, we had three bass players before him. And he said, all join. But we're going to rehearse every night for a minimum two to three hours. <laughs> wow. So you guys got pretty tight then at that point. Well, we got to the point where we could play the songs without even looking at a set list. Yeah. You know, it was like we could play these songs in our sleep. How old were you at that time? I was, I want to say I was 25. What? You were that old back then? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, you and... Uh, you and Greg Ginn met each other early on and went to shows together, but not punk shows because back then there wasn't a whole lot of punk going on, right? Well, um, one of the things that a lot of people don't understand, they say, well, you're punk rock, so you listen to punk rock and there's nothing else to listen to, which is the, 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 there, there's, a, there's an area when you're going up to San Francisco, up to five, if you look to your right, you get to a certain point where it's just cows. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. And all of the cow shit that they're standing in. Yeah. Um, and there, there might be some bulls out there, but th that would be bullshit, okay? <laughs> because, like Ed said, one of the things that happens when Ed and I get together, we don't talk about punk rock. <laughs> yeah. You know, we were immersed in punk rock. We were submerged. We were buried in punk rock. We grew up, there was other music that was going on before punk rock. Mm -hmm. And that's what we listened to. And we, that's what I find fascinating is because you formed, you, you turned Black Flag into what it became, which is the template for uh, trilling other punk bands, hardcore bands, you know, this hardcore scene that later emerged. Um, you guys were instrumental in that, and but you drew your influences from bands that were nowhere near in that vein. And you, and you somehow creatively twisted that into what it became. And I, I find that fascinating. We listened to other bands <laughs> as we were growing up because those were the bands to listen to. There was no punk rock. There was no punk rock until the Riot on Sunset Strip. <laughs> and those, those bands that performed at that time were not punk rock bands. Neil Young in Buffalo Springfield played a song that was fr pretty frenetic, pretty fast paced called Mr. Soul. Yeah. There was some bands that we would call garage rock bands. That's what I was into. That very, very, very much influenced who we who we are or who we were or what we were musically. The Seeds pushing too hard. The Standells dirty water. The, the Standells sometimes good guys don't wear white. Not everything has to be like you're in the fast lane driving 80 miles an hour. Like a leaf bird in a hay, Joe. That's the first version of that song I heard. That's still one of my favorites. Hey, Joe, where are you going with that gun in your hand? People think Henry threw a bed. Good for them. It cracks me up. You were into garage rock back then, country punk. punk. Yeah. So, do you, can you remember some of the bands that maybe were local heroes or never got known that were really influential that might have? Influential, and uh, uh, maybe just to you. A lot of unknown bands, you know. You know anything that like stands out that you remember or still listen to? Clear Light. I don't know. Um, they were a really great band. Their cover of Mr. Blue is amazing. There was two songs that really influenced me when I was a youngster, or younger. Uh, is Clear Lights cover of a folk song called Mr. Blue and they turn it into being really dark and heavy 
Yeah, like the uh, chorus line is, what will it take to whip you in a line? A broken heart, a broken head, it could be arranged. And then uh, the mother's trouble every day, that, you know, white Jewish guy doing rap over psychedelic music in 1965. That song is one of the best protest songs anybody's ever going to write. It's amazing. I, uh, I, I read somewhere that you were influenced by a lot of bands, but there was a band called The Last that you, you mentioned in your book that you were pretty influenced by. And, they, and you said, I think you mentioned, you alluded to the fact that it was so, somewhat surprising to people that they chose that band to mention because they weren't really in the vein of music that people would expect you to listen to. Here's the deal with them. Here's the, de here's the deal with what was happening when I was growing up. There was a certain point in time in, in L.A. music history where there were 12 bands. <laughs> this, yeah. this place might have been a desert. Yeah. This place could have been the ocean floor. Like I said, there were, I said 12 bands. There were probably 24 bands. But there was a period in time where the best bands that, that we could go see, local bands, Southern California bands, were the Quick, the Runaways. Um, there, there, there were a handful of bands in Hollywood, like the Hollywood Stars. There was the Pop. There was the Detroit Dogs. Now they were also, and they were also a very, very, very heavy influence on Black Flag really? because they showed up from Detroit, bringing the Stooges and the MC5, bringing that vibe. Toss in some Who. And you you got a great mix of bands going on, and that was the Detroit Dogs. Now the last happened to be from Hermosa Beach, where we lived. So we rubbed elbows with them. They had absolutely nothing to do with punk rock, nothing whatsoever, except that they knew a bunch of people that were in rock punk rock bands. Mm -hmm. They're all part of the underground scene kind of thing. Yeah. It was like, we lived in this time where if you were going to go out on Friday or Saturday night and you were going to go to your local bar and there was going to be live music, you were going to hear all of the hits that were on the radio. Top 40. And maybe a couple of, maybe a couple of original songs tossed in. Very, very rarely. I mean, one of, one of my friends who I grew up with, Juan, played bass in, in Rat, okay? Now, we're looking at the North Pole and the South Pole when you're talking Black Flag. Yeah. But he's one of my friends, and he's extremely talented, and I applaud him for doing what he did, you know, playing Monsters of Rock and at Donington Castle and, you know, all over the world. Great. Good for him. Well, I don't want to jump ahead too far, but you, you seem to be pretty known for making friends with people outside of the, your own scene. Like, you were hanging out with guys from, like, Molly Crew and, and Don Dawkins, I think, right? Did you know Don Dawkins? I did. Yeah, so, Rockin yeah, you've, you've always been a little more. <laughs> the Rock and Don Dawkins. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I... There, well, there, he was from down in there. Or that, he's South Bay. Yeah. The, the, the thing is, is... When the punk rock thing started to happen, all of a sudden they, they started writing chapters in the punk rock rule book. Mm -hmm. Like you got to get rid of all of your old records. You can't listen to Led Zeppelin anymore. You know, fuck that. I'm down with that. I'm, I'm, I'm going to listen to Led Zeppelin whenever I fucking feel like listening to Led Zeppelin. Because I grew up with Led Zeppelin. Just like Cream. Just like Steppenwolf. Mm -hmm. Just like the Seeds and the Standells, all of these bands, the British Invasion, mm -hmm. the Beatles, the Pretty Things, the Rolling Stones, <laughs> the Kinks, the Who, the Hollies, the Zombies. Grew up with all of these bands. I'm just supposed to give up listening to these <laughs> bands because <laughs> some some twerp and t some twerp that saw the. This is how Sid Vicious looks. This is what you're supposed to look like. 
Screw that crap. <laughs> mm-hmm. Later, later on to that noise. What about you, Ed? Do you feel that way? About about um, did you did you have a huge like a, a re- revelation in, in your musical taste, or did you sort of just add to what you were already listening to when you got into punk? Like, did did anything change for you? Uh, yeah, it's kind of like the sort of you know I was listening to underground heavy psychedelic music in the '60s. Never took any hallucinogenics, no, but I love psychedelic music. I told Dr. Leary that, that I'd never taken any one time I was with him, and he said, you don't need them. I thought that was pretty cool. <laughs> but, nice. you know, I, uh, you know, uh, Human Expression, Love at a Psychedelic Velocity, do you know that record? I bought that when I was a kid. I bought the pretty things and the 13th floor elevators, Velvet oh. Underground. Um, I don't know. So, uh, Keith, when you first met Greg and you heard him play guitar, was he, what songs was he playing? Was he playing early Black Flag or was he just kind of noodling around? Or I met Greg through his younger sister because she was dating the owner of one of the record stores that I uh, not only frequented but hung out listen to music in and also man the cash register Mm -hmm. and she would come in she was dating the owner michael and one day she happened to bring greg along with her what would happen at that time the collection of records behind the counter happened to be the first three Bruce the first three Bruce Springsteen albums Ouch. there were a couple of Joni Mitchell albums Ouch. Uh, the Lindsey Buckingham Stevie Nicks album um, he also listened to Poco but he was also the guy that turned me on to prog rock and I'll, I'll never, ever be mad about that. One of, one of our buddies, Paul Rossler, swears by it. Mm. And when I say prog rock, I mean bands like Yes and uh, Le Orme and Bonco and Green Slade, Manfred Mann's Earth Band. There, there are a ton of these bands. And the... the the, the majority of the punkers certainly dislike them <laughs> because the, the guys that played in these prog bands played circles around all of us. Mm, they were good musicians. The, oh, yeah. the, they were, not only were they good musicians, but they were great musicians. Yeah, like fusion. A lot of that's like wow. jazz fusion. But it's like yawn at the same time. We, we, we will blame jazz fusion. Mm. For the bad brains, mm. if there was no Mahavishnu Orchestra, mm. there would there would be no bad brains. And you know, getting back to the punk rock rule book, all of these bands, all of these bands that I've been rattling off, they're on the list of bands not to listen <laughs> to today. Really? And and, and I I I am. Uh, waving my middle finger yeah. in the air to all of that because I'll listen to whatever I choose to listen to. But when Greg, when you and Greg started playing together for the first time, it's unusual to take those influences and then you guys are like, look, let's cut the fat. No long intros, no thir- you know, four-minute interludes into a, in the middle of a song. <laughs> yeah, you know, you guys took it in a different direction. You might have been inspired by it in a way, but the way that you, the direction you took it um, w- was unique and kind of interesting how you guys, just, like I said, cut all the fat out, just went with the get in, get out. Was that your plan from the start, or did it evolve that way? Well, I, I think that... Um, you weren't writing rock operas. That, well, hell no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, we weren't thinking about Tommy and yeah. 200 motels and... That's it, sorry. The monkey's head. We were not thinking about the pretty things. Mm-hmm. We weren't thinking about any of that. What happened was, through Greg's sister, 
Michael, who owned the record store, said, I've got some tickets to go see Journey at the Santa Monica Civic. You guys want to go? It's like, of course we're going to go, because Thin Lizzy is playing with them. <laughs> so we're at the Santa Monica Civic. Thin Lizzy just gets through playing. The lights go on. So they're playing music in between the bands while Journey's doing whatever they're doing to get ready to do what Journey does. And I'm looking at Greg, and he's the the all of the all of the light bulbs are going on over our heads. Like we could try to do that. We, we, we could. Greg says, I, I've got a handful of songs. You want to hear them? And I said, of course. And that's when it took off. Out of the Santa Monica Civic into his living room <laughs> where, where we have, he has a practice amp. And he plays me like five songs. And my jaw is on the floor. Just the guitar part? Just the, just the guitar. Just ripping on the guitar. Just like, mm -hmm. get the fuck out of my way. And I never expected what I heard mm -hmm. to come from him. Out of these speakers. Yeah. Like... This, this shit's fucking... I've never heard anything like this. Mm -hmm. You know, I was slightly familiar with the MC5. I love Raw Power, which is Iggy and the Stooges' greatest album. Now, everybody can argue about, well, the first one, the Industrial, the Detroit, the, <laughs> the Automobile Manufacturing... <laughs> The production line, assembly line, boom, boom. Yeah, it's, that's all great and wonderful, and those albums are brilliant, but Raw Power is one of those life-altering recordings. That you heard on vinyl at the time, too. On vinyl, because they would not play it on the radio. It was just too... <laughs> it was too exotic for rock radio. I think CDs suck. They take the life out of everything. Compression or whatever. Whatever happens to the sound, it doesn't translate as well as it does from And vinyl. everything needs to be put in its place. Mm -hmm. So with the aggression coming from Greg's playing, do you think bands like, do you think he was maybe influenced by like the middle class with like Out of Vogue back in 77, them playing a really fast uh, punk style? We had seen the middle class probably four or five times. And um, we'd yet to see the Bad Brains. We'd yet to see Minor Thread. We had seen the germs, but the germs... And a lot of people say, hey, it, it was middle class and the germs that paved this highway for you guys. <laughs> The germs, the germs couldn't pave their way out of their own bedrooms. They were, they, they, it was just chaos. It, you would go to see the germs and they never, ever, ever made it all the way through a song. Mm. It was like, okay, when's this train derailing? <laughs> And I'm not taking anything away from the germs because they were there. Yeah. And they they certainly and definitely are an influence. Mm. But there's also DOA. Mm. We'd seen DOA a couple of times. The first time I ever saw DOA, it was like, who the fuck is going to fall? How how can X one of the greatest bands to come out of Southern California, follow that band. <laughs> and X came out and was like, some of these bands would force you to be on your toes. Some of these bands would force you to step up and do your best. 
Mm-hmm. Like, yeah, through you, you, you better be running fast because you're in a race that if you if if you stop to take a sip of water, you're gonna lose. <laughs> did you guys venture out to Orange County back then? And what did you think of like what was coming out of there? Because you know the middle class Santa Ana, and you had um, you know Fullerton scene was starting to come up. You had like the Mechanics and some earlier bands, you know, before. You know, like Rick Abney and all those guys got really going. You had some early influences out there, too. Did you guys ever experience some of those bands? We would go to um, Orange County, but they would be, the the shows would be. (laughs) Where? (laughs) Not in regular places. Mm. You know, if somebody did, had a party in their backyard or. You know, when, now when I say the OC, I mean like, you know, playing a playing a, a backyard party or playing in a garage down in Huntington Beach. Yeah. Okay. What about you? Did you do any shooting out there back then? Did you ever make your way out there for anything? Uh, yeah, I, I went to the Happy Times Roller Rink. I think that was the name of the place. And uh, I'd go to the Cuckoo's Nest quite a bit. Right, yeah. I like that venue. So when uh, you left, uh, how did the whole Circle Jerks come together as a band? How did that process happen? Um, the Circle Jerks in the beginning was just a hodgepodge mishmash. And um, Greg invited Lucky to audition for Red Cross. And the McDonald I'm brothers. Hetson, not <laughs> yeah. Now we're talking about Hetson. We're not talking about Gen. Yeah. yeah. Two separate guitar players. It's not him again. <laughs> <laughs> um, they did the audition, and there's a couple of varying stories as how it went down or where it took place. The McDonald brothers, who I've known for. Forever, I've known Steven since he was 11 years old. <laughs> Didn't like Lucky because Lucky comes from jazz, big band, swing, marching band. Mm-hmm. He's not a boom bop, boom boom bop, boom bop, boom boom bop. He's not that drummer. Mm-hmm. And they thought he was too proficient. They thought he was too professional. <laughs> and they were on their last legs. They, they were, this was, I guess would have been uh, Hetson's attempt at trying to save the band. Mm-hmm. And so Greg and Lucky became good friends. Mm-hmm. And at some point, I'm standing there and they're standing there and it's like, well, we've got a drummer, we've got a guitar player, and we've got a vocalist. Now all we need is a bass player. <laughs> and that was... Um, Kind of my job, I guess, was to uh, find Roger Rogerson, a drunk Roger Rogerson, <laughs> uh, standing against a brick wall on Melrose by the Anti Club, and I asked him if he wanted to sip off of my forty ounce, or, and he said, "Of course," and we got to talking. And I said, do you play bass? And he said, yeah. And I said, do you want to play bass in a band with me? There's a couple of other guys. And that one thing led to another. And we were uh, rehearsing in my garage over in Inglewood, California, which is also um, right next to the South Bay, right next to, uh, it's the, like, Further, furthest most west point of South Central Los Angeles. And that's where it took place, mm-hmm. in the pink house with the white bars. <laughs> keep, keep your nose away from my stash. <laughs> I don't want to jump, again, I don't want to jump ahead too far, but there's one thing that, this besides you, this, the Circle Jerks and Black Flag had in common, was where your names came from. And... You had, a, you had someone, a friend of yours, who came up with Black Flag in the bars, and then later on, I believe, gave you the suggestion for the Circle Jerks. Am I right? Okay, here, here's how this all went down. 
black flag were in a room, we're trying to figure out what we're going to call ourselves. We were originally called Panic. Uh, one of the guys somehow managed to buy a single from a, I want to say a Dutch band called Panic. And it's guys, we don't need to get into any kind of legal <laughs> BS with anybody. We're, what, what we're going to do, and the, maybe it was a premonition, we'll, we'll save that for later on, like 35, 40 years down the road. Um, we, we need to come up with a new name. And Greg Ginn, the, the name that he suggested was Rope. And Robo, Chuck Dukowski, and I looked at each other like we wanted to like shove a shoe in his mouth. <laughs> no, that's not going to work. Uh, as it turns out, Greg Ginn's younger brother, Raymond, happened to be in the room and he said, I'd call your band Black Flag. And then presents us with the four bars. On the spot? Yeah. Shit. And it's like, well, gentlemen, um, it looks like we've got our problem solved for us. And continuing on the thread with Raymond Pettibone, who's at that time started to become one of my good buddies. He was one of my drinking buddies. He was... We were doing drugs and smoking pot and all of that fun stuff. I quit Black Flag. And the, the Circle Jerks didn't have our band name yet. But we had a couple of shows coming up and it was like, what are we going to call ourselves? The Bed Wetters, The Runs, <laughs> Plastic Hippie. Um, we were in Raymond's library work room at his parents' house in Hermosa Beach. And I want to say this was on like a Saturday afternoon. And we were there because we were going to use some of his artwork for a flyer. But we still didn't have our name. We were just, we were going to just call ourselves whatever we were going to end up calling ourselves. And I'm looking through all the books, all of the different titles, and I see the American Slang Dictionary. <laughs> There's two two parts to this because it's so thick. <laughs> and so I, I, I grab volume one, and I'm flipping through the pages, just looking for any anything that pops out at me. And all of a sudden, I'm f flipping through the Bs, and now all of a sudden, I'm flipping through the beginning of the Cs, and here I am, CI Circle Jerk. <laughs> um, yeah, okay. Greg, what do you think about this? Circle jerks. You, you want the, the most ridiculously stupid name that you can come up with because what about the Beatles? That's a really stupid name. Yeah. The Rolling Stones? That's a pretty stupid name. They gather no moss. Was there a definition? The, no, they don't they, gather any moss. They just gather millions of dollars. <laughs> was there a definition with that name, like Circle Jerk, and then how to explain Yeah, but it we didn't even make it that far. No. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. Because that name just did, just jumped. Oh, yeah, le it, it leapt right out of the off that page. Hmm. Did, did Ribbon have a hand in the creation of the logo or the artwork that accompanied no, he like didn't. That, huh? no, he was um, he was starting to get busy doing some of the other things that he was doing. The black flag flyers and things like that. But all of the black flag flyers. There was a certain point where he was making sure that wh whatever Mel was pictured in the drawing had an erection. <laughs> because what had happened was. He got to the point where he was pissed off. He was not getting paid for any of the usage of any of his artwork. Mm. Even um, his brother was publishing 
he had what equated to be um, a comic book slash graphic novel thing called Captive Chains. And Greg never paid anybody for anything. Greg put those out? Yeah. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, well, Greg again put those in. Tripping corpse. Well, that actually makes me, kind of jogs my, my question in here. Um, when you left Black Flag, I know, again, well documented, man. There's a lot of tension in Black Flag, and mostly because uh, Greg had a pretty firm uh, hold on the creative control of the direction of the band, right? So when you started the Circle Jerks, did you set out to make that experience a lot different, more of a... Um, you know, uh, a group effort and less of a, you know, I don't know, less confrontational or someone who had control of the, the creative uh, direction of the band? Did you guys act more, like, as a team? The, the thing with Black Flag wasn't so much Greg trying to be in control <clears throat> and take, taking charge, because Chuck also played a role in all of that. And I um, didn't really get along with Chuck. Mm. I do now. I love the guy, but at that time, the Black Flag was impending, Im impeding my progress in finding out where the party was going to be on Friday night. <laughs> Understood. And that... They, they were starting to get serious, and I had started to get burned out. Like, what we, we spend so much time rehearsing, when are we gonna play live? I mean, we've, we've played shows live. They, when, I, when I quit, they told me, we have no shows booked. Wow which just lit, lit more fire under my ass to get the fuck out of there. Two weeks later, they, they played at the Hong Kong Cafe. <laughs> like they booked shows and didn't even, didn't even tell me. That, that's how important of a role I played in the band. Did they already have another singer lined up to play that gig? But he was already there. Mm. He'd, he'd been there because he lived in the church. Ron played drums in Red Cross, and he got to the point where he didn't want to play in Red Cross anymore, so he was just living in the church because it was so inexpensive. And one of the things that was happening with Ron was every night when Black Flag rehearsed, he was out in the hallway outside the door where we, where we were rehearsing, so he knew the songs, he knew the lyrics, he loved the band, we were all friends except for those of us that were falling out. And I would, I would, I would later find out, um, I would have a conversation with Robo, and Robo said, you really pissed me off, Keith, when you left. The band changed when you left. It was no longer fun when you left. Hmm. I said, well, why didn't you join in with me on some of these arguments that I was having where all of a sudden it's me against three guys? Who wants to be a part of that? Yeah. It's very unfair. And so it was not difficult for me to leave Black Flag. I was just not having fun. Yeah. We're not making any money. We're not getting paid for playing shows. <clears throat> I'm not having fun. Gotta get gotta get the hell out of here. That's the point, right? Exactly. And and then ultimately I would I would hear from Chuck who would tell me that Greg wanted to fire me and Greg couldn't figure out a way to tell me that my services were no longer necessary. I guess Greg just didn't have the balls mm -hmm. to step up and say, dude, you drink too much, you're doing too much cocaine, you're not really, we're not learning any new songs and my vibe was, we're not learning any new songs because are we going to record? No, we're not going to record. They ultimately did record the, the EP with Ron, 
was it five songs? I, I don't know. I don't know all of the songs. But um, he he only lasted six months in the band. Yeah. yeah. So maybe he was feeling the irritation from a couple of the other guys in the band. The awkwardness with the lineup changes was probably difficult, I would imagine, because you were, at the time, still living at the church, weren't you? I was still living at the church. Yeah. Um, I actually had a roommate who had run away from home, who would eventually become the bass player in a band called the Mau Mau's. Yeah. And then he would p play in uh, the Cramps, and he played in a couple of other bands. Joneses. The Joneses, yes. And... Um, at, a, at a certain point, my cash flow was ridiculously low to where I, I got to find another place to live. I can't, even though it was really cheap to live in the church, it was like, I've got to get out of here. Yeah. You know, I can't be around all of these irritating personalities. A lot of tension. A lot of tension. Yeah. I'm sorry, I just have one more question for Ed. Did you hang out at the church back then? Never went there. Never went there, not one time. Mm -hmm. I don't recall going there. Nice. Um, so when the oops, gotcha. uh, circle jerks, you guys are together. Uh, how did the music writing process go? It was, uh, would Greg do a lot of the, the ideas, or how did that process come about? Well, there were four of us that had all of these different ideas. And ultimately, um, one of the things that happened was Greg had been a member of Red Cross and the tourists. They were the tourists before they turned into Red Cross. Stephen and Jeffrey were in the Black Flag rehearsal space. And we all looked at them and said, like we all ganged up on them and said, you know, you're going to need to change your band name. The, the tourists don't cut it. <laughs> and they changed, the, they changed their name. Yeah, um, and they got sued for it and had to change it to well, a different Yeah, they had to, they had to add the extra D and the K. and mm -hmm. um, I don't know if they got sued. Maybe they were just told. With it. They were told. Threat. Look, we're, we're a, an organization that's been around since the beginning of time, True. and yeah. you're not calling your band Red Cross. Maybe they got a C&D letter or something. Yeah, cease yeah, the and good old, desist. Good old cease and desist, yeah. <laughs> um, you know, or maybe somebody else came along with that possessed some kind of intelligence when it came to those kind of things and said, you guys are going to have to change your name, you're going to have to do something here, mm -hmm. because you're going to get in trouble. And... When they were breaking up, as they were breaking up, the McDonald brothers told Greg, we're not, we're not using these songs anymore. Mm -hmm. Go ahead and do with them what you want to do. Mm -hmm. And so Greg obviously took that and ran with it. And um, one of the very first shows we would play, we would be in a room where we had probably about 50 people that wanted to just um, take us to the end of the pier and chop us up and use us for uh, lobster bait. The, the, the scenario was that we changed lyrics and sped the songs up. We added a few things here or there, removed a few things here or there. Basically, the structures were the same. Yeah. But um, I had worked on some songs when I was in Black Flag that were never used. The lyrics were used, and then the lyrics were unused. And one of the things that happens when we get into... Uh, legal territory is that um, a, lyri a lyricist owns half the song. And I, I, I consider myself a lyricist at times. 
and I occasionally come up with some music. But um, we just went for the anarchy and the, like I said, there were a lot of people that really disliked us. When did, uh, did you guys get to the point where you were ready to record? How far into the band? I'm, I'm really terrible when it comes to questions like that, but one of the things that happened with the writing process was we were just taking our time. We were in no hurry. And then one of us, I'm raising my hand, booked a couple of shows because my ass started to itch or something. Um, and one day in our rehearsal space, I said, guys, we have 12 songs. We have a couple of shows coming up here within the next two, three, four weeks, we need to come up with more material so we can go out and play live. And that's, that's when the, the songs in question were, well, here's the riffs. Mm. Here's this riff. And I, I, I looked at the guys in the band and I said, I, I was basically looking at Roger Rogerson where it's like, you guys have been in other bands. Have you created any musical bits in any of these bands? And a couple of other things got tossed into the pot. You, you have to understand the way we worked is there's a pot in the middle of the room. It's a cauldron. It's bubbling and gurgling. It looks like it could be lava or like boiling tomato soup. There's bricks and tree branches and all sorts of stuff on fire underneath, wood logs, and we're tossing stuff into it. We're making the stew, and that's how we worked. So it wasn't like some bands, the guitar player will bring a riff, and then the rhythm session fills it in, and then the, you know, the singer penned some lyrics to it. You guys didn't work that way at all, huh? You guys just sat in a room and banged out ideas until it became a song. We worked however we could make a song. Whether it be one guy coming in with the guitar riff, whether it be, hey, like, Lucky is like, well, I've got this drum thing that I'm working on. Mm. It's like, okay. Did you like that process more than you did when you were working out the Black Flag songs? Um, or was it just different, not better or worse? No, it was it was different, and it wasn't better or worse. The thing with Black Flag was there was a lot of energy, and it was like we were angry, and you can you could feel that, you could hear that, you you could if you saw us play live, you could see it, mm -hmm. where we were just pissed off. We were in we were in we were in a neighborhood where. Like I'd said earlier on a Friday or Saturday night, the best you were going to get was the Doobie Brothers, the Eagles, oh and God. fucking uh, Brewer and Shipley or fucking um, Fleetwood <laughs> Mac. Wow. Yeah. And not not the good Fleetwood Mac. <laughs> yeah, they're, not the they're... ultra mega million selling fucking stadium rock band. Yeah. You know, you there was a time and place in this city where you would go in a record store and that would be all you would hear. You would go into a liquor store and they would be playing it on the fucking stereo in the liquor store. Timbers. You'd go into the market yeah, and record. normally you would you you wouldn't hear any rock music. You'd hear all of the fucking elevator music and there was an elevator fucking music version of go your own Everything, way right? or fucking <laughs> yeah. pass me the the Coke spoon or whatever. The Coke spoon, nice. But Circle Jerks, you guys had the same intensity, but you had humor in it. And it seems like you guys had a different mission, if there was even, I don't know what to call it a mission, but you guys didn't take it, you guys weren't as intense maybe in, in the way that you wanted to, I don't know, I don't want to call you guys a party band, it wasn't like that. But We were a party band. Okay, you can say it. nail on the head. <laughs> See, we wanted to go to the party. Yeah. 
You guys were we wanted to, right? we wanted to, we wanted to hang out next to the keg. <laughs> we wanted to know where the drug dealer was, and uh, maybe be in charge of whatever record was being placed on the turntable that everybody was talking over. Whoever was going to dance to it or whatever. Yeah. Black Flag was really serious. Black Flag was angry. Black Flag wanted to wreck things and destroy things. And that's what was happening musically. That was was happening lyrically. And when I left, I was walking away from all of that. I'm still angry. I'm still angry right now. Did your partying uh, escalate from going from Black Flag to Circle Jerks? I know you're sober now, but were things getting crazier for you, do you think? As a party band, the the change? Things were getting crazier, yes. And then I, I, I would have my moment of clarity. And I'm, I'm still here because if I hadn't have had that moment of clarity, you'd, you'd be talking with somebody else. Hey, Ed, when's the first time you saw Circle Jerks? Close. You know, I don't know. Um, Hong Kong or the whiskey? What, I'm not sure what year that would have been. Well, we've shot photos on Sunset Boulevard and yeah. uh, at the the liquor store across oh, the street. Yeah. And what year was that though? Was that eighty? That the, would have been eighty. And the yeah. record came out in eighty one. I I think I don't I, yeah. I don't know all of that crap. <laughs> I have a dates too. Uh, what, what was your impression of Circle Jerks, though? Going, seeing Black Flag and, and... That's a terrible question to ask him in front of <laughs> they you know, Because he's going to sugarcoat it, and he's going to oh. make it all sweet. Well, no, we pulled the Circle Jerks for rap. I don't know, man. But I don't know. Ed doesn't strike me as that type. <laughs> <laughs> they suck. <laughs> Keep those a rack. No. <laughs> we... we spent a lot of time around each other mm. back in those days did you hear a, a buzz like from okay from from your end of it was there a lot of buzz about these guys when they formed the band was there people like kind of anxious to hear what what keith was going to do next uh not that i heard I, you know it was kind of like once they got out and started playing then there was a buzz yeah you know you know people but the early black flag, you know, only a handful of people knew that was going on even, you know. Yeah. Was a lot, how how a did lot you different. figure out which bands you were going to focus on or go see, or was it just random? Uh, no, I photographed the good ones. It, it's, it's really simple to have it random, because what was happening at this time was you would have four or five bands on a bill at a at a club show like the Hong Kong Cafe. Mm -hmm. And it's like, okay, Fear's headlining. I'm going to go see Fear. But I get there early and I end up seeing two or three bands before Fear. And you're like, And oh. I'm just like, well, this band's as good, if not better. You know, it's yeah. like, that's the way it works. Yeah. It still works that way to this day. I've found some awesome bands by just showing up early. Mm -hmm. So it still goes on. But I, but I was just curious because you had to be very uh, frugal with how much film you were using oh, yeah. and all that kind of stuff. Back then, you know, I had money for gas and and uh, copy and film, kind of, you know. And the, the and it wasn't like you didn't have the digital, you know, stuff. So you everything everything Folk was an expenditure. You mean? <laughs> uh, well, yeah, you know, yeah, you you know, everything had to be kind of sort of uh, rationed, I would imagine. So we went out to shows and stuff. You know. I don't know, you know. I remember one show I shot eleven rolls of film. That was kind of excessive. Yeah. When I shot the Stray Cats in 1980 or something like that at the Roxy, I shot 27 photographs. Did they pay you for it? No. <laughs> hey, all that stuff. No, I'm just being facetious. None of that stuff was worth for hire. None of it. For the love, right? Yeah. Did you I, did you get recognition from the bands that you shot in any way? Like, were they let just let you into shows for it or doing anything oh, to yeah. kind of, like, you, know, you know? I was always on lists and stuff and hanging out. It was kind of like, you know, I've, I've sort of likened that early, like the birth of hardcore to like a five-year party. You know, no, no, I wasn't doing drugs and drinking myself. I've never done any drugs except smoke weed. Yeah. You know, but, uh, you know, it was like, you're always seeing your friends. 
you know, there was only a couple hundred people in the whole scene, and you'd see them multiple nights a week, you know. You, when you go out, you'd see them. Like, hey, how come you weren't at that? How about it, beer then show it, last night? Then it, then it blossomed yeah. into where uh, we're no longer playing at the Whiskey A Go Go or the Hong Kong Cafe. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Like, we've, we've got a, the, the next step is from two to 300 mm -hmm. to 500 mm -hmm. to 1,200. When did you start, when, at what point did you start seeing faces you didn't recognize? Because it was a close-knit scene, a couple hundred people. If you're going out to shows a few times a week, three, four times a week, you're seeing the same faces. When did you start to notice, wait a minute, there's a lot of people here that aren't from our scene. Oh, yeah. You know, that, coming in. That actually happened early. Yeah. yeah. Pretty early. That actually happened Pretty at the Hong Kong Cafe. Drawing crowds. You, you know, like on a Friday or Saturday night, all of a sudden, there are people coming in from the valley, or there are people coming in from Riverside, or there are people coming in from... Um, the OC. Yeah. San Gabriel Valley. That's where I was coming from. How was yeah. the how was the change like so when group sex comes out, how did things change for the circle jerks? You guys just all of a sudden get a lot more like obviously that's such an iconic album. Was the recognition immediate? It was it was very well received. Yeah. We we can thank Rodney being in Heimer. Mm -hmm. Um there, there there will be a lot of people that will uh Diss on him, but the the simple fact of the matter is, is for us being in bands, he was um, our pathway into uh, actually being played on K Rock during so lunch one the, time. One of the only stations that would play that stuff, right? Well, the all of the all of the. Um, Indie college university stations would play it. Yeah. Were you guys doing? Uh, when did you guys actually start touring? Was that soon after that album? Um, we you toured before the album, hadn't you? A little bit. Well, it depends upon what you call touring. Like, like a, a weekend gig up in San Francisco or Sacramento. That we didn't really consider that to be a tour. Yeah. You know. That we we wouldn't get serious about our touring probably for at least a couple of years after that, mm -hmm. and then it got ridiculous. Like we we would go out and we would be gone for two, three, four months at a time, and this this would be going out, leaving Los Angeles, and hoping that we we could pull up to the bar where we're going to play and and talk the owner or talk the manager into letting us play for the 12 kids out front that aren't going to be able to get in. That They're, they're going to just have to stand outside and hear whatever they can hear when, when the door to the bar opens or, you know. So it's like, can, can we... Can we play an early show? Can we just set up and have these kids in here before you start serving any drinks? Mm -hmm. You know, so we were we were playing a lot of nights. We were playing two shows if we were lucky. If we if we had the sales pitch to allow the person running the the bar to to open up for these kids. Mm -hmm. You know, and granted, it could be six kids, it could be 20 kids. Uh, we, we, when we got, when, when we got um, bigger as a band, I remember we played a show out in Las Vegas at the Huntridge Theater. And we pulled up, we started moving our gear out into the venue, and as we're moving our gear backstage, the, the ceiling in the middle of the room collapses. Oh, shit. Like, oh, n no. <laughs> the, the, <laughs> all of the people that are going to be here, all 1,200, are all going to be standing under this hole in the roof, <laughs> hoping that the rest of it caves in on them. Wow. So we obviously knew there was no show that night. We pulled our 
our vehicle out into the parking lot. And at that time, we were on a um, really horrific tour. I mean, we were signed to a label that just did absolutely fucking lutely nothing for us. And it was like, we just, we, we've got to look for every possible um, fun thing to happen for us. So we, the, the vehicle that we're driving was capable of being, if we could find like a, a, a power source, we could plug our vehicle the generator in the vehicle would be enough power. You know, the, yeah. the the electrical system in the vehicle was enough juice to power our guitar and our bass. <laughs> and we played in the parking lot, and there were about 40 people there. These were like all of the people that were going to get there first and be first in line so I could get the T-shirt and <laughs> be at the very front of the stage and all of that fun stuff. Mm. And, of course... We, I, I think we got about 20 minutes into whatever we were playing and all of a sudden it looked like um, the, the parking lot for the police convention. <laughs> yeah. Where did you guys crash during that, that first tour with the Circle Jerks? How, did you stay with, with fans, people, friends? Probably no hotels, I would imagine, yeah? Um, there was some scampering for people to let us sleep on their floor. You know, and if, if you were lucky, you'd get the couch. Mm -hmm. um, I, I remember one night, and this was when Earl Liberty and Chuck Biscuits were our rhythm section. We were playing in some faraway place and it was freezing cold and the roads were slick and the snow was about six feet deep. And the, we didn't even have to ask. The girl came up to us and said, my parents are out of town. I live in a three-bedroom house. There's plenty of places for everybody to sleep. There's plenty of food in the refrigerator. Nice. You know? That's a uh, <laughs> so it's like, all right, turn the heat up and we're flowing. Mm. And as it turns out, I, I find a nice little comfortable bed. I guess it would have been in her brother's bedroom. And at about four in the morning, everybody's finally settling in. It's like the party had gone on long enough. <laughs> You know, we got a long haul to the next city we're playing in. If the roads are in the condition they're in right now, we're going to be creeping yeah. along. And so everybody's starting to relax, and all of a sudden there's a commotion in the living room. And all the lights in the house are, are turned on. <laughs> like every fucking light in the house, it's like, what, what is this? It's like, time to go. Mom and Dad had come back from oh. their trip <laughs> with circle jerks, with, right. bringing little, <laughs> bringing little brother along with them back to the house, nice. and the, this uh, sleeping scenario was not going to happen. Shit. So you know, you talk about uh, a little bit earlier, like Minor Threat, uh, Bad Brains. When you finally hit the East Coast and hit like DC, what what was it like playing with those bands? <clears throat> Well, those crowds were very energetic. There was a uh, um, certain portion of the crowd that were straight edge. Um, they were very appreciative. They knew all of the songs. They knew all of the lyrics. They sang along. There, there was just a great energy in the room. And there wasn't... It, if there was anything that resembled violence... It was quashed immediately. Like, you're not doing that here. Mm -hmm. Like, they actually police themselves. That's pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah, you, you know, your 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 bro falls pick while up. slamming. Pick them up. Pick them up. Yeah. yeah. A little different than what you guys were used to back then, <laughs> right? Yeah. Oh, we saw all sorts of stuff. 
Well, you photographed those guys too, you know, in LA and all that. What we'll, we'll, was your impression of Minor Threat and Bad Brains early on? They were both really fantastic bands. They were great. Good did, shows. Did you ever hit the road, Ed, and go outside of, you know, oh. follow any of these bands or anything? Uh, twice, I think. Oh. Well, I went up to San Francisco and I don't know, you know when I did the Wild in the Streets cover, but. IRS Records, I worked for them in the mid-80s for quite a few years, and they sent me out on tour with The Alarm. And they were going to send me out with R.E.M., but didn't, and sent me out with The Alarm. They should have been the other way around. But uh, R.E.M. hired me to do the all the photos for their Fable to the Reconstruction album and took me on a wow. two-and-a-half-week East Coast college tour. That was fun. Wow, that is cool. Mm -hmm. What about... Um Circle Jerks playing CBGBs for the first time. What did you think of CBGBs back then? It was just a dump to play. Yeah. <laughs> You've seen photos of that bathroom. Oh, oh totally. yeah. <laughs> I could smell it from the photos. Did yeah. you take a shit in it or a piss? <laughs> no, it, it, it was, first off, it was um, their equivalent of the Whiskey A Go Go. Mm -hmm. And we played the we we played the whiskey probably six or seven times, mm -hmm. and it 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 was the first club that I'd ever been to, the first rock club, or the first club that that um, had touring bands, mm -hmm. major label bands. Yeah, I and, saw the Kinks there, and T-Rex there, and the Cream there. I saw Cream in 67. I hate their later stuff, but I saw them all at the Whiskey. Wow. Did you play other venues when you were out there besides CB's, like Max's, or any of those other venues that were sort of... What other Ma venues? Like Max's Kansas City, that, that venue, or... No, no, those? Max's was... Max's, by the time we made it out there, Max's, I think, were, they were on their last legs. Okay. And there was no... The, there weren't really real punk rock bands playing at Max's. Okay. Their their scenario was that they it was kind of like the the difference between the Hong Kong Cafe and Madame Wong's. I understand. Mm -hmm. Oh, I see. What about um? What were some of your favorite like New York bands early on that you guys were playing with? Were you guys buddies with like Agnostic Front and those guys? We we played with the Agnostic Front. We played with, well, the first New York band we played with was the Stimulators, which was Harley, Harley who was at that time I think he was twelve or ten or something. Or, yeah, yeah. I think he was like ten. That's right. Were you <laughs> impressed? I was just impressed the, by the fact that he was. They're doing what he was doing. Yeah. We also played with the Necros, who were from Ohio. Necros are rad. Where did you play with them at? Was it in New York? It was at um, Irving Plaza. Oh, okay. New Jersey, we, right? We played a show at the Mud Club during the middle of the week, and that was a complete, utter disaster. Um, we had one person in the crowd... And all of the people, all of the staff, I think, um, at one point, there were, they, they might have started the night off with six people and they cut it down to three people because they realized they didn't need a doorman and they didn't need a uh, bar back. They didn't need a waitress. You guys can go home, right? <laughs> wow. That's crazy. And the, the one member in the crowd was Cheetah Crumb from the Dead Boys. Oh, that's cool. And he was um, not all here, I, I, I think would be a good way of putting it. Yeah. Uh, he managed to take all of the furniture, like the bar stools and the high tables, and he piled them all up in front of the stage like he was going to just... Set it all on fire. Oh, shit. Okay. I mean, he was like, he had that look in his <laughs> eye like a, like a, a six-year-old that got his first book of matches. <laughs> and he was actually using it as a, as a ramp. 
He was using all of this furniture. He would get at the back of the room and he would run across the room and he would leap up onto the stage off of all of this furniture piled up in front of the stage. Wow. And he would start twisting all of the knobs <laughs> all the way across, <laughs> all the way to... Eleven. Yeah. Eleven or wherever it goes. Shit. And at one point, um, Roger was like, you got to tell this guy to get off the stage. <laughs> and I looked at Roger and I said, you don't tell Cheetah Chrome what to do. <laughs> <laughs> no yeah. footage of that exists, huh? There, nobody, there was no yeah. cellular... <laughs> But you know, no one was ever filming filming devices at that time. Yeah, like a, no just cameraman. didn't do that. Yeah, man, to have to have a camera guy in a corner during that thing it's it would have been amazing. It's all lore, huh? Yeah. yeah. What about um, yeah. Yeah. back uh, to Los Angeles? Like, what was it like playing at the Olympic? You mentioned you talked a little bit earlier about that. Was it? Well, those shows pretty. Well, amazing. the Olympic was just a big, oh. massive hall that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> cement it was like what are you gonna break <laughs> you know if, if you if you if you break the urinals you bust the urinals off the wall in the men's room you're just gonna piss on the floor you know it's, at, a, at a certain point people got hep to not ruining the place you know don't shit don't shit in the hand that's going to feed you mm. People eventually, there was a certain point in time where it was almost a requirement to go into a venue and, and wreck something. Yeah. Because what are they going to do? The vandals. You know, and that. you're, you're, I live in Hermosa Beach. I live 25 miles away from all of this. And this is not a place that I come to on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. I'm going to get drunk. And I'm gonna bust something. I took a picture of the vandals at the music machine in the bathroom after they torn the urinal flush handle off the wall. I think humans holding it. That picture was used on the cover of a flip side. And I was with Steve when they played at the I think it was a T Bird roller rink in Whittier where I don't I don't know why I don't have pictures of it, but he walked into the bathroom and just boom, boom. Boom! And just walk down and kick, wow. kick one at a time. Kick three <laughs> toilet. No, kick three toilets yeah. off the bottom. The lights was all flooding and stuff. It's like, oh my god, that's crazy. Mm. So, uh, were you like? I know you're on stage playing. You know, were you like uh, aware of all like the gang violence that started happening in the scene, like uh, like '84, like um, some of the stuff that was going on? How was that? Well, I just I I thought that. That aspect, the violence, was ridiculous. You know, because there were there were other things to be <clears throat> angry at. And if you were gonna get violent, why don't you get violent against somebody that deserves the violence rather than just some random guy that you don't know that happens to be at the venue yeah. who happens to be there because he wants to be a part of something. He wants to be part of the, the, the group. He wants to feel the energy and the excitement and see the band and hear the band and, you know, hear all of the different things that are going on. And what had happened was, originally, the Hollywood punk rock scene was a click. At one point, Ed said there were like 200 people that were part of this clique. That were all... Um, and half of them were the bands. And the, the, they were art students, they were college dropouts, they were uh, future actors, actresses. Um, they, they wanted to have a party scene and they didn't want it messed with. And when bands from Huntington Beach and Orange County and the South Bay and the Valley 
when 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 these bands and these people started showing up, they brought a different mentality. Entirely. Yeah. And what it did was it upped the energy. Mm -hmm. And in doing so, it made things more uh, uh, electric. It made things more exciting. It made things so it was like, you got to be on your toes. Mm -hmm. You might catch an elbow. You know, you, you might get kicked in the ankle, which was something that was not happening in the very beginning. Mm -hmm. And let's say you got a, like, random wild drunk. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But what happened was the energy got kicked up. Yeah, hardcore. And we were um, constantly being harassed by the jaw. I'm calling them jocks, not athletes. There, there's a difference. <clears throat> um, because I grew up in Hermosa Beach, and I was surrounded by athletes who were guys that had hair down past their breasts. They were up at 4.35 in the morning getting into their wetsuits and going out and surfing. These kind of athletes, mm. not jocks, mm. not the guys that played baseball and football and water polo, not those guys. Mm. Although some of them, you can't just lump them all together. Because I knew a lot of jocks who didn't have the, the full-blown mentality. They were actually real human beings. Mm. <clears throat> But we were we were the ones that were being called Devos and <laughs> you know Fuck you, Devo. And this is like a like a guy that would end up uh busting Bronx in the rodeo. So here's this group of people coming in that initially drove you into the the, the, the people that I that I'm talking about with you, you have to understand that you have all of those all of those dudes from Venice who who not only surf but rode skateboards. Mm -hmm. When when there was when there weren't any waves and it was raining or it was foggy, it was time to get out of town and go do some skiing. Which this would ultimately lead to snowboarding, mm -hmm. which is skateboarding without wheels on on snow mm. we grew up around all of these guys and they're not jocks they're they're athletes mm. all of a sudden there's the slam dance and there's the stage dive and these are all moves if you look at them you look at the slam dance it's basically there should be a skateboard underneath these guys doing this dance you have the stage divers where are we we're in southern california what's southern california one of the swimming pool capitals of the world mm -hmm. and what do you do when you're at a swimming pool you dive off of whatever you can dive off of to get into the water yeah chuck burke and my wife city flip photos of skateboarder yeah, absolutely. Um, can I, so the the, oh, the jocks slowly came into it and didn't know, and this maybe is not the right word to use here, but I would say the proper dance etiquette. <laughs> yeah. Well, because their motivations were different. They're coming in, and they. It, what I find interesting is how these guys come in and they're the same people that kind of drove you to punk rock in the first place, to alternative means of, you know. And Haiti. You know, and then now these same yeah. guys Four, are infiltrating. Later, they're in, in it's your, 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 your lifestyles, and they're making you feel like you're the outsiders. That's ridiculous. You know? So you had your athletes, you had your, your, your jocks. So how bad was the jock problem initially? Well, don't forget, we got to add the gangs. Yeah. We had the punk rock gangs, which was pr probably one of the most ridiculous things anybody has ever come up with. 
It's all territorial, right? Like, I, I'm already in a gang. Yeah. And we're not here to fuck with anybody. We're, we're here to fucking have a party. So on the one hand, it brings up the excitement, like you said before, and the energy level. But on the other hand, now you're dealing with a lot of conflict. Did it affect the gigs? Were there fewer gigs? Were there clubs that were like, now nah, we're not doing this anymore? That happened quite a bit. Yeah, it did. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, that, that was why at one point the Olympic Auditorium was doing all of the shows they were doing. They were doing like one or two shows a month. Mm -hmm. You know, and that was enough for them to, you know, keep, yeah. keep their hands filled. Now, there were still some clubs that would allow it, but probably um, prayed that they never had to use their um, entertainment insurance. Yeah. Yeah. What about security? Did the violence get ripped up on their end? Because they're dealing with violent people now, and security people aren't exactly the most patient you know, understand well, people. At a, at, a, at a certain point, at a, the, a certain point, at a certain point, see, at one point in time, the security guys could get away with whatever they wanted to get away with. Yeah. Like clubbing people with pipes in the hills surrounding the Hollywood Bowl. Yeah. Like, are you kidding? Like hospitalizing people because they're trying to sneak into the Hollywood Bowl and maybe sit with some people that are sipping wine and eating some fine, stinky French cheese, you know? Yeah, it's fucked up. You know, sneaking into a Grateful Dead concert. <laughs> you know, we're sneaking in to see Pink Floyd. So did you guys get blowback from these these other outside influences? Like, were you treated differently from those security guys? Like, were you lumped into those people, the gangs, the violent guys who came into the scene that weren't really in it for the music or the art? Were, were you guys all sort of lumped into that category? Did you guys get some fallout from that? Um, I don't ever remember receiving any kind of backlash for playing the music that these guys wanted to listen to. Right. It's like, I have no control over who comes to the shows. Yeah, exactly. But if I'm on stage and I see something happening that's not supposed to be happening, I'll step up and say something about it. And I have got backlash for doing that. Can we talk a little bit about uh, the decline of the Western civilization? No, we're not going to talk about that whatsoever. Um, <laughs> okay. I'm, I'm just pulling your leg. And you actually, you were in it, but you also worked on it a little bit with Penelope Spears, did you? Um, I helped snag a couple of the bands that played at the Fleetwood. Huh. That was, I think, that was the, was that her final... Like, she, she shot Fear, the Alice Bag Band, which basically was the bags, the Circle Jerks. Um, I also heard she filmed a little bit of the Gears. So, the, the, throughout the years, there have been people that have just been up in arms over her choice of bands that were... That appeared in the movie. Yeah, like, like it's it's really it it really leans towards s slash records and slash magazine because Kick Boys bands in there and Fears on slash and X is on slash and the Germs are on slash and it's like so what mm. what the fuck mm. all those bands are totally happening you know. Yeah, yeah. Um, it, there were people that complained that the plugs and the weirdos and the gears weren't in it. And, you know, there's a, this whole list of all of these bands that c could have or should have been in it that weren't in it. Like, just take it for what it is. Mm -hmm, at least and she ultimately stepped up and said, I shot all of that on film. You know how expensive <laughs> film was at that time? Mm -hmm. I gotta rent those cameras. I gotta pay the crew. Is all that footage sitting somewhere? Will we ever see it? 
I, I don't know what happened, but maybe some of the film got destroyed. Maybe what she shot of the gears just wasn't yeah, good enough stuff. to be. Yeah. Who, who knows what her... It, that's her that's a question you ask her yeah yeah that's a that's an iconic movie for sure for us i mean it got me to see how you guys lived and it was, what i liked about it was it was like it kind of followed the bands around you know the church you know what i mean you talk about the church we got to see what that was like and um were you at that point you were never involved uh, up to that point in something that had that much production was it kind of a trippy to see like Cameras at a show, how, how it all went down, behind the scenes, kind of viewing it. There weren't really any behind the scenes going on. Mm -hmm. You know, we were Action. like, we're here to play. It's like whatever the technical, you know, all of the cameras and how many people and who's going to be on stage, that's for somebody else to sort out. Yeah. I don't think I've seen it since it premiered, <laughs> you know, on Hollywood Boulevard. Yeah. Well, it, what it did for us was it allowed us to be seen by people in faraway places mm -hmm. that had absolutely no idea as to what we were or what we were about, mm -hmm. what we sounded like, what we looked like. There were people that had read about us and maybe had seen some photos in Flipside or Slash Magazine or Maximum Rock and Roll. No mag. No mag. <laughs> Actually, no, not no mag. No mag wasn't happening at that time. What year? At the at the at the, they at the decline. In the 70s. They were they were going before that movie was released. I don't think so. No. I don't think so. <laughs> Ed, when, when the Circle Jerks were in that ma magazine, our lineup was Chuck Biscuits and Earl Liberty. Yeah, I remember. And our original lineup was with Lucky and Roger. And we... Yeah, but it was going before you were in it. We, we, um, we, yeah, we were like, what, the fourth issue, fifth issue? <laughs> But anyways, rather than argue about that, um, we got a call from a promoter on the East Coast who worked out of Irving Plaza in New York. And he said, would you guys like to come out and play a couple of weeks worth of shows here on the East Coast? And we said, of course. He said, here's the deal. I'll fly you out. I'll put you up. You'll have transportation to all of your shows and whatever money you earn playing the shows um, will pay for your food and your gas. We said, well, we're not doing anything. We've never been to the East Coast. Some of us had never been to the East Coast. Uh, one of us was born on the East Coast. But anyways, it was like... Of, of course we're going to do this. Play Irving Plaza, play the Mud Club, play the 930 Club in Washington, D.C. with, with uh, Minor Threat. Play um, the Stardust Ballroom, with the, or the, no, the Starlight Ballroom in Philadelphia with the Stranglers. <laughs> It's like, how, how could we not want to do this? Mm. What else are we going to do? You know, so basically what that film did for us was open doors. Did it help you guys? When did you guys actually go over overseas? Did, did you guys go overseas early on? We went to Hawaii for a week. We played five nights. At a, at a club in uh, Honolulu. Pipe nights, really? Yeah, it was ridiculous. <laughs> like opening night, there were probably 300 people there. And <clears throat> closing night, there were probably 500 people there. And in between was maybe for three shows, hmm. two or 300 people. 
Yeah. But it, it was fun, yeah, you know, fine, and right. all of our expenses were paid. Mm. Um, I've got to use the restroom, gentlemen. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, oh, you're good. good. Pause. <laughs> Break. Yeah. Oh, I Running wild in the street. 